Now I'd ask you to please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. One of the great benefits of encountering another culture is that it helps you to see your own culture in a new light. <clears throat> Most especially, experiencing a new culture helps you see certain assumptions that are embedded in your own way of life that you never realized. There's so many things that we take for granted that we don't understand and we don't realize that, we don't, that there is another way of doing things. Now, this is obviously true when we look at things like healthcare or higher education in the US. We take for granted, for instance, that healthcare premiums will go up by 5 to 10% per year and that we will have large out of pocket expenses. It's pretty shocking when you can go to another developed country and discover that that's actually not the case there. The same thing is true for higher education. There is currently an ongoing debate about the value of forgiving a portion of student loan debt. And yet, most other developed countries don't pay nearly as much as we do for higher education. In those places, there is not the assumption that anyone who goes to a college will graduate with a mountain of debt. What a concept. The same thing happened during my trip to India over my sabbatical. I was struck by the different assumptions that each culture had. Indians, for instance, assume that it's perfectly normal to have cows wandering the streets. I remember in Delhi seeing a cow on a multi-lane highway. The cars didn't make a big deal of it. They merely slowed down and drove around the, cra drove around the cow, as though it's another day on I-10. <laughs> the ensuing traffic jam didn't seem to bother anyone either. Meanwhile, I was there in the taxi saying to myself, there is a cow in the middle of the highway. <laughs> and these cows had the habit, as most cows do, of defecating whenever they felt the urge to do so. And so you can imagine this, the impact this had on the streets and the smell, particularly when it was over 100 degrees outside. But cows on streets or highways are a perfectly normal occurrence for people in India. So yeah, different cultures have different assumptions. One assumption that struck me in India was that the belief in God was a given. Of all the Indians I spoke to over the four weeks I was there, and there were quite a few, not one of them identified as an atheist. Most of the people that I met, actually, who were Hindu, did not identify as practicing Hindus. But skepticism of Hinduism did not extend to skepticism about God. The divine simply was. Coming from the US, this struck me as odd. Why was it that Indians didn't have the same debates over God that seem so common here? Had they not read Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens or Sam Harris or any of the other, the so-called new atheists? What was going on? As Americans, we assume that every culture shares the same intellectual tradition that we do. The Western intellectual tradition has so dominated our thinking that it's hard to realize that our tradition does not have the same weight in other parts of the globe. In our tradition, the 17th century laid the groundwork for how we see the world. Rene Descartes famously created a sharp divide between the world of matter and the world of the mind. Descartes is a guy who said, I think, therefore I am. There is the thinking self, and then there's all the stuff outside that we observe. This mind-matter dualism became a bedrock belief in the West. The scientific revolution of the 17th century was built upon these assumptions. You had the world of matter that relies on the laws of nature and the physics of Sir Isaac Newton, and then a separate world, separate world of the mind. It's hard to overstate how much this framework has shaped our conception of God. Rene Descartes and Isaac Newton were good Christians. They wanted to separate their belief in God from their philosophical work or from their science. By the 18th century, this led to God becoming the God of the deists. God was transcendent. God was up there in heaven. God created the world and the laws of physics 
and then stepped back to let everything function on its own. God was not necessary for the functioning of the world. God became supernatural, above and beyond and separate from the natural world. God as supernatural is an 18th century concept. Religious people affirmed that God occasionally would come down from heaven and act in the world. The work of Charles Darwin, of course, only reinforced the framework of nature functioning on its own with a separate supernatural God up in heaven. This set up two competing camps in society. On the one hand, you had those who could see no evidence for God in the world. The world functioned just fine without God, and if God were present, there would be some change in the natural world that demonstrated God's presence. These folks were highly skeptical of miracles, which were defined as violations of the laws of nature. If God existed, a big if, for these people, God was irrelevant because God never showed up in a way that made people pay attention. On the other hand, you had the Orthodox Christians who tried to make a case for, for an omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent God, and they tried. Theologians had to explain how God could be all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good, and yet somehow not come down and change all the evil of the world. Theologians had to figure out how to reconcile the stories of the Bible, these pre-modern stories, with the Western intellectual framework of a post-Cartesian world. And they did their best, but they had a lot of critics. The new atheists today, like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, have not written about anything particularly new or groundbreaking. Their perspectives are quite old. It has its roots in the time of Rene Descartes and Isaac Newton and the deus of the 18th century. Voltaire covered ground like that long ago. Practically today, <clears throat> this Western intellectual heritage means that you have folks who come to church, folks who get a lot out of church, folks who have feelings that they interpret as God, and yet have a hard time articulating a coherent theology of God. Churchgoers, when they're honest, are often unsure about what to do about God. They can often recite various apologetic arguments, but doubts about God oftentimes still linger. Does that sound familiar to any of you? Christianity in the US, in all its many forms, relies on this Western intellectual tradition, and it defines our discourse, the way in which we frame conversations about God. So you can imagine how shocking, how unsettling it is to travel to a place like India, where these basic assumptions are simply not the norm. What's going on? What do we do with a place like India? Now, unlike the Western Protestant tradition, in India, there's a long history of holy men, or sadhus. These are men who devote themselves to liberation from the cycle of death and rebirth. They have developed, over thousands of years, techniques for spiritual enlightenment. There we go. Uh, so they, they've developed, these, these gurus have developed techniques for spiritual enlightenment, and the great gurus of, the great gurus of India have achieved levels of spiritual enlightenment that simply have not been part of the Protestant Western tradition. That's not our way of approaching God and spirituality. In the Protestant West, salvation has been defined, and I'm sure many of you who grew up in more conservative churches can say this, salvation has, has been defined as having faith in Jesus. We are born again or regenerated. We are saved through our belief. Those who have faith in Jesus then are allowed to live into the moral requirements of the New Testament. Protestant Christianity is activist. It focuses on helping others. It focuses on personal piety, on living out the moral guidelines of our faith. What does it not focus on? Trying to achieve spiritual enlightenment. And here's the key point. In India, you have holy men who have achieved spiritual enlightenment. And what, they what they've discovered from that intense internal journey is the unity of all things. In that experience of enlightenment, there is no divide between mind and matter. That's an illusion. In that experience of enlightenment, the gurus of India have found unity with God. The existence of God is not in question. God for Indians is not some supernatural being in heaven who chooses to violate the laws of nature or not. God simply is. God is the ultimate reality of things. 
God is everywhere and in everything. Anyone who has gone through that journey of spiritual enlightenment can attest to that. Now, Indians would certainly affirm the, the insights of physics and science. But that in no way contradicts the, the supreme reality of the divine that gives life and energy to those very same rules of science. The divine is always there for Indians, and science doesn't change that. Now, can you see how profoundly different this Indian perspective is? Can you see how it reframes the entire debate about God and why, even if Hindus, even if certain Indians reject specifics of Hinduism, they could still affirm God as the ultimate reality? Now, despite the dominant Western intellectual tradition, there are philosophical viewpoints in the West that align with, or at least are similar to, an Indian perspective, one of which is idealism. The, now, the, the predominant Western perspective, philosophical perspective, is materialism. The, under, the underlying assumption is that matter is the fundamental starting point for understanding the world. In a materialist framework, everything in the universe can be understood, can be boiled down to its basic atoms and their interactions. Our conscious minds, for instance, are a result of material actions in our brain. Our minds are secondary to the material, which is primary, which constitutes them. Again, this is materialism. Materialists claim, at least many do, that our consciousness is merely an accidental byproduct of chemical interactions in our brain and actually doesn't have much relevance at all. But materialism, in spite of its dominance, is not the only coherent way of viewing the world, even though it's so deeply ingrained in our culture. Idealism, on the other hand, which was very popular in the 19th century and before, posits that ideas are primary. Our minds are in fact the starting, our minds are in fact the starting point, not matter, for reflection on the world. Everything that we experience in the world, we only experience because and through our minds. We don't actually know that the world around us is real. I might not actually be talking right now. <laughs> we don't know. When we touch something, it seems solid because our brains tell us, oh, this is solid. We have, no, we have no way of knowing for sure that that's the case. The movies The Matrix and Total Recall both play with this idea. How do we know what is real? Only because our minds tell us what is real. Idealists claim that ideas, minds, are primary. A religious idealist would claim that we all exist within the mind of God. The world we experience is the product of the mind of God. Indian, Indian gurus claim to see this reality when they experience spiritual enlightenment. They can see the world for what it is. They can see the mind of God that pervades all of reality. It's a fascinating thing to consider. And this tradition does have roots, or does at least have analogies in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Our reading this morning from Psalm 139 is an, is an excellent example of that. Given what I've just said, Listen again to these words. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's so high, I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed me in my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. You behold, you, your eyes beheld my unformed substance. There's not an idealist perspective. I don't know what is. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them has yet existed. Here's the psalmist talking about things pre-existing in the mind of God. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to an end. And I'm with you. The psalmist, that ancient writer, like Indian gurus, meditated on his experience of the world. In his deep meditation on reality, he comes face to face with the divine. He's overwhelmed by the intimate presence of the divine. God is everywhere, 
Everything is contained within the mind of God. This is not a purely intellectual exercise for the psalmist. God's mind is the source of all that is, including the psalmist, when he was only in the womb. There's a majesty and wonder to it all. And when the psalmist comes down from his spiritual ecstasy, he writes down all that he experienced in this beautiful psalm so that he can remind himself of that reality, that reality experience that he knows what is. God is not some transcendent being up in heaven who occasionally deigns to enter the created world. God is infused in the created world. It's a profound vision. What do you think of it? Can you see where the psalmist is coming from? The 20th century Jewish thinker Martin Buber, Buber wrote an influential work entitled I and Thou. Buber argues that we relate to the world around us most often in an I-it framework. In other words, we encounter the world around us as various objects that are distinct from ourselves, that we analyze, put in boxes. This is also true for most people that we meet. We might enjoy their company and do things with them, but fundamentally they're objects that we associate with, different from ourselves. They are separate from us, and their existence doesn't normally affect our internal being, this I-it relationship. But Buber argues that we also relate to the world on a deeper level sometimes. In our encounter with other things and people, there are times when those, when those interactions do affect our very being. There's a relationship there that is deeply personal, one that shapes us. And Buber calls those interactions I-thou relationships. Thou, of course, is the archaic second person singular. Sadly, it's long since passed out of use in English. But most other languages still have a second person singular. If you know French, for instance, it's the difference between tu and vu. You use the second person singular, thou, only with those whom you know very well, who are your intimates. Otherwise, you should, say, otherwise you should use the second person plural, you. For Buber, it is those I-thou moments that affect us and change us. Those moments when you interact with the world and with people on a personal level, before your brain can analyze it and categorize it and turn it into an it. The I-thou relationship happens on a pre-thinking level and it emerges from raw experience. And our experiences of God, our knowledge of God, comes from these I-thou experiences of the divine. Because God is God, God is not an object like other objects that we can analyze. As soon as God becomes an it, our language fails us in defining God. God is beyond language. But we still experience God in those I-thou relationships. Those moments are real and they shape us even if our words fail us when we try to describe them or analyze them. And Psalm 139 is a classic attempt at explaining this I-thou experience of the divine. In that moment, the psalmist knows that the divine is real. He, experiencing the, he experiences the divine as all-encompassing. Then he later tries to put it into words. But as he says at the end, I try to count them. They are no more than the sand. I come to an end, but I'm still with you. What if we were to take the imaginative leap into the mindset of an Indian? Let us say we were to take seriously those I-thou experiences that shape us, but we can still ill-define. Let's say we were to take at face value the statements about God that the psalmist makes in Psalm 139. What if God is the ultimate reality of the world that lingers behind and in everything? What if ideas, not the material world, are primary? What if this world is an expression of the mind of God? What would that look like? We would be able to see the world around us as infused with God's presence. So often the Christian tradition, particularly the Protestant tradition, has seen the world as fallen, bad, and broken. But if God truly infuses the world, if the world is a reflection of the mind of God, you can see the inherent goodness in the world. Even those parts of the world that might seem ugly at first blush, when you can look at them, you can see God is present there. In moments of great suffering, God is still there, supporting us, working in and through us. When we meet someone else, we can see, really see, the image of God within them. 
It's far easier to see past apparent differences and find a compassionate viewpoint when we can see the image of God in someone else. Walks in nature become strolls through a mystical landscape. Books and ideas and art become reflections of the mind of God. There's a certain optimism that takes hold and gives us hope. But there is perhaps an even more important ethical takeaway. And we see it clearly in, Psalm, in the words of Psalm 139. God sees us. God sees us as we actually are. God knows our flaws, our passions, our histories, our wounds. We do truly stand naked before God. There's no hiding who we truly are. There are few things quite so inspiring for me as someone who has integrity, someone who is comfortable with who he or she is. That reassurance that you were knit together by God means that all of you is a part of a divine puzzle. Certain pieces may seem out of shape, but when they fit together, you can see a beautiful picture emerge. This is something that has brought peace to many gays and lesbians over the years. When I first came out of the closet, I put on my Facebook page a line from Psalm 139. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. It's something that helps people who struggle with mental illness or disabilities know that they are blessed, even though they might feel alienation from the world around them. Those who have been told they are less than for one reason or another can look to Psalm 139 and know that despite what others say, they are God's creation. This weekend is Labor Day weekend. It's a time to celebrate and honor organized labor, but it's also a time for us who labor to find some time to rest from our work. In a moment of rest that you have in the next two days, take out these words from Psalm 139 and read them over again. Think about the perspective of the Indian gurus. Imagine them in deep contemplation and the awareness they gain from the unity of all that is and the presence of the divine. Think about the psalmist deep in meditation about God and life. Honor that. Find a meditative space for yourself on this Labor Day weekend where you can explore within you that presence of the divine. Go on your own journey of spiritual contemplation. Exercise those spiritual muscles. See the world as a miracle crafted from the mind of God and realize the grace that can come into your life through that awareness. I'm not saying that we'll all go in the next two days and become a guru or find enlightenment through a few, minutes, through a few moments of contemplation, but I do hope that you can get a taste of that which that has so shaped the Indian perspective on God. Our time in this world is limited. Now we can see it as meaningless interactions of various atoms where our minds are accidental byproducts or we can see it as a reflection of the divine at work in the world, inviting us all to a deeper appreciation of what is and basking in the glow of the love of God. It starts with contemplation, meditating on the divine. Join the psalmist on the hillsides of Palestine some 3,000 years ago and watch in wonder what can emerge. <laughs>
be seated. And now let us all enter into a time of prayer and reflection. A prayer of Catherine of Siena for the contemplation of God. Eternal God, you are a deep sea into which the more I enter, the more I find. And the more I find, the more I seek. The soul ever hungers in your abyss, O God longing to see you with the light of your light. And as the deer yearns for, for the springs of water, my soul yearns to see you in truth. <clears throat> A prayer of Ramdas to see God in all things. I make the effort to maintain a ground of oceanic silence out of which arises the multitude of phenomena of daily life. I make the effort to see and to passionately open in love to the spirit that infuses all things. I make the effort to see the beloved in everyone and to serve the beloved through everyone, including the earth. I often fail in these aspirations because I lose the balance between separateness and unity and get lost in my separateness and feel afraid. But I make the effort. a prayer of Hildegard of Bingen that speaks to your blessedness. Good people, most royal greening verdancy rooted in the sun, you shine with radiant light. In this circle of earthly existence, you shine so finely, it surpasses understanding. God hugs you you are encircled by the arms of the mystery of God. Amen. <clears throat> 